I'm going to make a, a bunch of PowerPoints that have software training in them. I made it on the Google Drive. So um, this would be the first software training for control systems. Basically converting something into the frequency domain, you use Laplace transforms. And why we do something like that is because um, it allows us to analyze systems much, uh, much easier. Uh, the algebra is just so much easier when you turn things into a frequency domain because what you're essentially doing is you're taking the the time or like t in the equation and you're changing that to an s and then s you can treat just as a normal variable in linear algebra so I know that you haven't taken differential equations but essentially what differential equations are are there um, that the answers to differential equations are equations. I know that sounds weird. Usually when you have equations like with an x or a y, you want to solve for x and y. But for differential equations, what what it is is once you the answer to that differential differential equation is an, another equation that has some element of time incorporated into it. So it's time based. It has a lot to do with things that involve time. So, for example, like an electrical circuit that I'll go over a little bit later, um, that's very variant of, of, on time with some of the devices. So they use differential equations to describe um, the, you know, the circuit. And so what you can do with that, um, uh, the circuit, is turn the differential equation into the frequency domain, and then you're able to analyze that system on a lot higher uh, level, and it's a lot easier to understand it that way. Differential equations when you when you do that it sometimes get a little it gets a little hairy. So just turning it into the frequency domain allows you to understand it a little bit better. And there's all these different types of techniques that you can do um, to understand your system even better, like Bode plots and um, and uh, root locus. These are different things that you can do to understand your system better. I'm not going to go into that. This is more this is very light. These are things that. I implemented into the vehicle itself. Um, so I want to go over some of the fundamentals first and um, and not not it, I don't want to hit too much on you know Laplace. We'll do it some somewhat in the quizzes, but uh, it's going to be really, really light. I mean uh, later on in, uh, in some of your classes you'll take differential questions and you'll get more exposed to it. So um, so let's see, uh, putting a system into frequency domain allows us to have a better understanding of the system and it turns the differential equations to transfer functions. And you can, you can, I'll put this PowerPoint online available to you after. And if you have any questions in the middle of it, ask. Because if you have questions, I'm sure other people would. So the, um, in, in, uh, in these type of systems, the control systems that we would create, um, oftentimes what people do is they, um, uh, uh, um, the block diagrams that we uh, create the control systems out of, they have an input and an output. That's generally how it works. Like for example, if you're talking about a DC motor, let's say you, you model a DC motor in control systems and you have block diagrams um, with all the different components of what makes a DC motor a DC motor. Your input might be something like voltage, and your output would be, or, or sorry, your, your, let, let's start from the, your input would be the angle, the desired angle that you want to move, and your output would be the angle, the actual angle that you've moved. And so the desired angle that you've moved and the actual angle that you moved could be two different things depending on where you are on the timeline. Because when you want to be at a certain uh, angular displacement with the motor, you won't get there instantaneously because you have to overcome friction and the um, polar moment of inertia. There's things that limit you from going to the desired displacement right away. And that difference is called error. So however much the d desired displacement differentiates between the actual displacement, that is your error. So it's just a difference of the two. So that would be an example of a, of a block diagram control system. And your input into something like this to analyze whatever you're creating, in this case a motor, 
um, you can put in simple signals into the system. These are examples of simple signals that you can put into the system just to see how the output would react on the other side. So a unit step function of uh, frequency domain, um, it would be considered 1 over s. So it's a 1 over s. You can convert back and forth between the frequency domain and the time domain. So in the frequency domain, it's 1 over s. Here I have a graph, and it's denoted by L for Laplace. Another way that you'll see Laplace denoted as is capital uh, of the function name. It's called the image. So you'll have capital F um, of S indicating that you're in the Laplace domain. And then you'll have F of T if you're in the time domain. So F or F of T just in the time domain is just one. But once you start going over to the frequency domain, it's one over S. And uh, for the unit ramp function, is just another one of those type of functions that you put into your system and you see how it reacts overall. So let me give you an example. Um, I'll go over to this uh, control system that I have here. So what this is, if I go up on a higher level, so this is a, a block diagram of DC motor. I'm putting in a step function. And the step function is just a voltage. What voltage it is, is specified by this. It's the voltage of the motor. I'm, I'm putting 24 volts. So it's a step function of 24 volts. So when I run this model, if the voltage was 24 volts, then how my uh, velocity, for example, would look like. This is just a scope that I put in the middle of the line to detect what the signal is at that point. If I look at it, you can see that 24 volts, it, it originally speeds up, and then it gets to a certain point where the speed remains constant. And that's just looking at one part of the system. There's other parts that you can look at as well. So, for example, the angle position. So you can see that when I apply 24 volts, if I'm constantly applying 24 volts, this is the the time axis down here, and this is the angle, then over time, as time increases, I'll be more, I'll um, have more and more angular displacement. And you can see the original, it's called um, the transient right here, where it's not a perfect straight line because it takes uh, overcoming the friction and the momentum to be able to start going at a constant speed and you can you know going at a constant speed you can see that here i mean it takes a little bit for it to start going at constant speed so once it's going at like once you can get this into a straight line with the velocity then this is where the angular displacement will start going in a straight line and yeah ask any questions don't don't be afraid to ask so uh so that was just a unit step function. And I just put scopes in different parts of the control system to see how it reacted. That was a 1 over S. Um, actually, it would be 24 over S because I wanted it to be 24. So, I, uh, and then the ramp function, you can change accordingly. The, um, uh, so let me finish this. Increase the voltage from being one every second. So it would be more along the lines of, so you know how in this control system, see this unit step function where it just looks like a step that you go up? Mm -hmm. This step would be 24 volts, and it would stay at 20 volts, 24 volts consistently. A ramp function would be just ramping up constantly to see what my um, my signals are. So it would be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 at, across um, the time up until a certain point that I specify. And again, th this is just to see how your system will react. So if you have, like, for example, a potentiometer on a circuit, and you, you keep raising it or keep lowering it, and then you're putting more voltage into the system over time, you'll create different types of signals than if you just had it constant. And that's what you're measuring, right, pretty much. So um, the we usually use block diagrams, like you saw in the uh, MATLAB, to to 
uh, model the control system that we're working with. Uh, the, the block diagrams, each one, each block is uh, a transfer function that feeds into another one. So the goal here is to be able to come up with differential equations in such a way to um, have one equation feeding into the other equation. So if your uh, input is voltage and your output is current, then the next block needs to be able to have the input be as current and output be as something else. So they're feeding off of each other, um, one after the, the other, and that's how you make a control system. And I'll show an example later on. So um, the block diagrams, um, they're, they're not just a way of modeling it on a high level of what's going on. You can actually do uh, uh, algebra with these block diagrams. So each block diagram, when they're right next to each other, that would be just multiplying them. If they are um, a split and um, they're being added together at the other end, it's just adding. And I'll go over a little bit more about block uh, diagram math later. But um, all of these can eventually become into one transfer function. So it's, it's a really nice thing to have. The, these block diagrams can split up into very basic individual components of the whole entire system, or they can combine together to give you one transfer function. So lots of little transfer functions, or combine it together to get one big transfer function. And, and what you generally do is you model it in the small sub, subsystems, so you can make sense of the control system, and then you bring it all together to have one big transfer function. And from there, you can start doing things like creating PID controllers and, and understanding your system a little bit better because it's the variables in that bigger transfer function that you're able to utilize in such a way to understand what your overall system needs. So it, from, for example, like a big transfer function, you can tell if it's, if you can um, reduce, um, you know, make it more damped, more damp signal, or you can increase or decrease the point at which it goes at. Like for example, if it's um, if the angular velocity reaches 8,000, I can increase or decrease the gain, is what it's called. So it can be less than 8,000 RPM, or, or it can be seven or 6,000 RPM just just by changing these type of variables. And, and I'll go more into that a little bit later in the example. So this this is actually the example. So this is uh, so let's talk about a brushed DC motor and and make an example out of this. So let's start with the circuit of a DC motor. You know you have a voltage applied to it. You know that there's some type of resistance, uh, some form of resistance in the motor, and then there's some type of inductance with the coils because it's a brushed DC motor. Mm -hmm. So with all of these components, you can model that. Um, you can basically model the uh, the circuit with this um, differential equation. This would be considered a differential equation. So it's uh, it's uh, the inductance times the derivative of uh, the current over time plus uh, the resistance times the uh, current equals the voltage. And how I'm getting that is the resistance times current, it's Ohm's, Ohm's law. V equals I times R. I times R is voltage. So you're adding like voltages here. So from the inductor, you get a voltage across it. So the equation for finding the voltage over the inductor is the inductance times the derivative of the current. So differential equations are those that have some element of time involved with it. Usually um, the derivatives, um, di dt, it'll have di dt in the differential equation. The really nice thing about uh, uh, putting it into the Laplace domain is derivatives how you make uh, derivatives into the Laplace domain, you just times whatever it was by s. If you're integrating, you divide it by s. It's very nice, very, very simple and straightforward. So in this case, I took the, uh, the derivative of the current over time, and I turned that just to multiply by s, and I made it a capital to show that it's the image of 
the current, or in other words, it's it's the Laplace of it. And that's just, you know, that's the characteristics of, of changing things into Laplace. If you're doing a derivative, you times by s. If it's in, uh, integral, you divide by s. So now I have L, uh, LA, um, which is the inductance of the armature, and then the current, uh, and then you're multiplying by s, and then you have plus Ohm's law, R, A, I, A, and then that is equal to the voltage. So what I'm doing here is I'm essentially splitting up the I, A. Let's, let's actually let me try to write it here. So if I have L, A, then I, A, S plus R, A, I, A. Oops. You can uh, essentially factor out the I. It'd be L, A. And have L, A. Uh, I'm not used to this tablet yet. You have LAS and then plus RA, right? Mm -hmm. And then from that, from that, you're able to um, bring it over to the other side where VM is. And then so your control system becomes VM. So whatever the signal is, it's VM times the... Uh, block diagram which is what we just did so we factored it on the other side and this is what it would look like and then the output would be the current and that's how you get your block diagram does that make sense yeah. so We went over the electrical system, so this is the electrical component of, of a motor. And we used Ohm's law, the input was a voltage, and the output was a current. What I just did, the same rules apply for all of the other components that we're going to do. Um, for this particular case, it's, it's, it's slightly different. Um, you're still wanting to make a block for the control system. You're still having the input be a current, because the output of this was a current. So the next thing is your input on the other one needs to be a, a current and your output needs to be something else going into the next block. So there is some type of electromagnetic contribution in a motor uh, and this is the equation to it. You have um, I cross B and that will equal the force. So I mean, this has to deal with the magnetic field that's creating in the motor turning um, it, it, it turns the, uh, the shaft and it allows you to, to basically find your torque. So a lot of the times they ref refer to this in the data sheet as the torque constant. And you can see the Ka right here. In this case, we didn't do any differential equations to get the block diagram. We just did what we needed to do to convert it to torque. Because the next step involves a differential equation where the input is torque. So you see how it's kind of like a puzzle where we're just fitting everything together. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, this equation you can find online and, or in most data sheets, you'll, you'll find it for motors. It's just called the torque constant, just like that, the torque constant. And you multiply it by current and then out you'll get torque. And if you can't uh, find it in data sheet, you can always refer back to this. As long as you know um, these characteristics about the motor, you can plug the equation in and get the torque constant yourself. So the next is the mechanical contribution. When I was talking about the friction and the moment of inertia that you have to overcome to be able to start going at a constant speed. So the input in this case would be a torque and the output would be an angular velocity. And this would be the equation, the differential equation to this, where you have the polar moment of inertia uh, times the derivative of the angular uh, velocity over time plus 
the viscous friction, which is Bm, times the angular velocity is equal to torque. So right off the bat, you should turn, you should in your mind you should know that hey, I see a derivative. I need to convert that to um, a Laplace. And so you know you have the capital of omega <clears throat> times it by s, and then you see you have omegas here, and so you convert. The, you know, you factor out the omegas, you bring it onto the other side, and then there you'll have it. It's very, very simple algebra. Here you'll have this, and so now this is your diagram where you have the torque coming in, you're multiplying it by your transfer function. This would be considered a transfer function, and out pops the uh, angular velocity. And then for the last part, of the DC motor, there's electromagnetic feedback where you get, uh, I mean, you probably heard us talk a lot about EMI. and So this is this component, and, and this is the, you have to be able to count this into your control system if you want it to be an accurate representation of your motor, because this is what physically happens with your motor when you ramp it up or ramp it down. There's uh, some EMI introduced. So if your velocity is bigger, your EMI will be bigger because of this equation. And uh, you can see that there's also some form of constant for this. Uh, most times they probably don't really have this in the data sheet, but you can always derive it if you know these constants. And there you'll just have one variable. In goes angular velocity and output is voltage. You see where we started with is we started with voltage, the input was voltage, and we're ending with the output is voltage. So this effectively creates a feedback loop where you have input voltage and you have the electrical contribution, the electromechanic contribution, mechanical contribution, and electromechanical contribution. Is there any questions so far? So so this isn't exactly correcting itself. I'm doing so when in control systems when you say um, when you want to correct something, you'll usually usually use something like PID controllers to do that. In this case, it's a feedback system, but it, it's no, in no way of me helping the system with controllers that I'll add. I mean, I'll add controllers later to make the system a little bit stable, but for this feedback, there is, there happens to be a feedback that in this case is probably not helping your overall system. Generally, you want to avoid EMI. EMI happens to work out as being a feedback loop because, like I said, there's, there's some mathematics that are involved with this. Um, and in terms of the algebra that you have to do when you work this out and you get one big transfer function, um, this is just how it turns out that there's the feedback or the electromechanical contribution. And in a way it makes sense because out of this you have velocity, angular, angular velocity, you're timesing up by this, you get the voltage EMF, and it goes back into this little circle right here. And this circle is basically subtracting from the overall voltage. So it's actually getting rid of some of the voltage that you input it into the system, which is, which is for most cases, generally bad because you're inputting a power, your, your power into uh, the system. And then here you have the electrical, uh, the EMI coming back, the electromagnetic feedback, and it's getting rid of some of the voltage that you put into your system originally. It's getting rid of power. Okay, so that's all you've got. Yeah. And that's why you have a feedback, because the output is a voltage, and it's affecting the voltage in a way where it's subtracting off the main voltage. That's why you have a feedback right here, and that's why you have the negative sign right here, to symbolize, hey, I'm subtracting it from the overall voltage. So uh, all of this should make sense, because uh, we went through the electrical, uh, electromechanical, mechanical, and... Um, or electromechan me um, magnetic and electromechanical contributions... Uh, and these are all multiplying by one another. If you wanted to combine this, you just multiply the electrical contribution, the Ka, and 1 over Jm, S plus Ba. Right here, what I have is, and, and it's, this is very nice and elegant. Remember how I said timesing it by S was a derivative? Mm -hmm. 
yeah. and dividing by s was in, um, integral. Yeah. Well, if you want to get velocity to position, you would integrate it, right? Yeah. So I have angular velocity right here, and I wanted to get to angular displacement. All I have to do is integrate it, and that's how you integrate it into, I mean, super simple, because you basically take derivatives and integrals to just a place where you're just doing algebra. So this is what I get right here, the angular displacement. Now this is of the motor. A lot of the times motors will have a gearbox or a gear transmission that uh, just because the motor is spinning super, super fast, um, the motor itself, doesn't mean that's how fast the, the shaft is spinning on the other end if you have a gearbox. And so you'll have to step up and step down the gear transmission uh, accordingly, uh, mathematically, in order to get the what you, the angle that you actually see on the other end of the shaft. And so that's just your gear transmission, stepping up or stepping down the um, the angular displacement accordingly in this case. You can, if you didn't want to convert this to angular displacement, you could have gotten rid of this one over S and just have the angular velocity of the motor and then multiplied it by the kg and then you would get the angular velocity of the end shaft. So it's however you wanted to model it. So uh, before, what I what, like the title says, it's a block diagram of DC motor with no load. This is if it was just spinning freely. However, most times you put a load on the end, like a gear or, or um, a robotic arm or something. So you'll have a, some load associated with it. Right here is when I introduce load. I also made a small simplification. So something that um, I'll go more in depth later on is, remember how I said each block was essentially a transfer function? Right. So when you have a transfer function and you can turn into one bigger one and then you can analyze even further, well, the cool thing is they're all transfer functions and you can analyze each and every single one of them. You can do tests on each and every single one of the blocks. So in the case up here, let me do an analysis on this electrical contribution. Let's think of what we're actually doing here. And so there is something um, called um, first order and second order transfer functions. In this case, it would be a first order transfer function. How do I know? Because you'll get a transfer function that um, doesn't have any second powers to it. If, if, you, if you're talking about a second order transfer function, you'll have to the power of 2, like what I have up here. Uh, on the bottom you see s squared, um, and on this you just see s. And what this is doing is um, if you get the block into this type of form, or if you can get it into this type of form, you can analyze what these mean individually. So this, the plus one, this always has to be a plus one, no matter what you're doing. So whatever the transfer function is, you have to get it into that form. You, you have to, in order to analyze it correctly. And so once you get it into this form, your K is considered your gain, and that's the point at which your signal will level off. So you saw in velocity that the signal was leveling off. That would be considered your gain. So in, in this case, when I ran it, That right here is your gain, a little bit over 800. So, and then you have your T. And your T is 63.2 or 63.3 percent of the way to get to the gain, if that makes sense. So, um, you go, um, once you find your T, whatever your T is, you go up and you hit the line. And then wherever that point is, that's 63.2% of the way to a stable system where you have the gain being consistent or where you have the signal being consistent that meets up with the gain. The, all the gain is is the point at which your system meets that signal. So if it's, you know, if the gain 
it's 24 volts, you're going up, and you go all the way to 24 volts, and you can get there. Or and that you know, might have been a bad example. So you know, the angular velocity was a really good one. So you go up to the angular velocity, and you get right there at around 800 rotations per minute, and then that's your that's your gain. So this is still called the transient. That is still called the transient. Yes, the time it takes for you to the 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 initial part of it. And so is uh, two thirds of it. The T is always two thirds. The T is always 63.2 percent. That's just the magic number. Okay. So, and, and this is the information that you can get out of the first order. Now, the second order might seem a little bit scarier, but you can actually get more information out of a second order than you can a first order. And in fact, sometimes you want, or most times, you actually want to make the transfer function a second order so that you can analyze it better. Or not not just analyze it better, but you can implement PID controllers in such a way to make it a second order system, so that you can control the system a little bit better. Because if the system is only first order, there's only so much you can do with it. If it's second order, you can control certain aspects of it. And, and most systems, for, for the most part, the the bigger systems are um, are second order. Or the systems that at least that we'll be dealing in in the club, uh, they'll be second order and maybe even third order, which are beyond the scope of what I'm going to be talking about. But I just want you to know that these things exist. So you saw in this PowerPoint or in this slide that there's the electrical contribution. It's one over L A S plus R A. So I'm going to draw or try to draw. And I'm basically taking, so I want to get this in the form K over T S plus 1. That's the form that I want to get it in. So if I want to get the electrical contribution into this form so I can analyze it further, all I need to do is divide by RA here, divide by RA on the top, which is the resistance, and divide by RA right here. So if I do that, this would look something like 1 over RA. Uh, let's get used to this. 1 over RA plus T over R. A plus 1. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Because R over R is 1. Or sorry, I, I said T. That was wrong. I should have done the overall would be 1 over R A over L A over R A plus 1. That should make more sense. So you can see that I divided by R A on all of them. Divided by R A here, divided by R A here, divided by R A here, and you effectively get, uh, and sorry, I missed an S right there, the S for right there. And then so this is your time, and then this is your gain. So your gain is 1 over RA. That's the signal that is what it's going to get to. And your T is 63.3% of the way to your gain. And that's how you can analyze these subsystems. On the mechanical contribution as well, you can do the same thing. So if I go to the next slide... You can see that the time constant when I when I work out. So you, usually resistance of a motor is normally around 15 ohms. Generally, for for most brushed DC motors, it's normally around 15 ohms. This will show up in the data sheet. So you can plug in this number, and then you the inductance that's also that also is shown in the data sheet. 
at least decent data sheets it's showing you. So you'll have your LA over RA, and the time constant that you get there is generally um, this order um, of magnitude. It's usually this small. Now, if I did the same procedure with the time constant of the mechanical contribution, that time constant is going to be much, much bigger because electricity happens super fast, super fast. And you can, I mean, you can see right here, this is 63.3% of the overall signal to get to, to where you need to be. I mean, what the, what the S signifies here is the, the transient, the time that it takes to, to kind of get to that point. So uh, by finding out the time constant of the electrical contribution and finding out the time constant of the mechanical contribution, you can basically say the electrical contribution is insignificant and you can effectively get rid of it. And that makes the system a little bit easier. So this is just an example of how you can rationalize or get away with making the block diagram a little bit easier. It would really have no bearing over the entire control system if I got rid of that. And it just makes things a lot easier. So that's why in the previous one, you saw one over LAS plus RA, and now you just see one over RA, because I was able to make that rationalization. And I can still say I can get current out of this, because like I said, the time constant was just so insignificant. So this is, this is what it then becomes. So now this is with a load. So uh, with a load and torque disturbance. So the torque disturbance comes from here. This is where the torque disturbance is. And then the load comes from here. And this is kind of in the first couple of quizzes. Uh, it's not too important, but all I'm doing here is just finding the angular velocity, doing the gear transmission to get this into uh, the end shaft where the load is, and then doing essentially the same exact thing where I have a component of the polar moment of inertia and viscous friction, and then I, I get torque out of that. And then from that, you need to convert torque to the end motor side. So you, this is on the link side, and you want to get it before the gearbox. So now this is the torque of all the way before the gearbox, and then you're subtracting it from the overall torque. So it's getting rid of some of your torque, which makes complete sense because if you have a load on it, the, so you're, you, you have all this torque that's being generated by the motor, and then the load decreases the torque if you're trying to apply that same torque on another body. So the torque will reduce, or the load will reduce the torque that your motor can apply if, if you have a load on it. And, and like, for example, just like a, a little, um, I, have you ever seen the servos that have like little flag flags on it are just like a, they're basically servo attachments so that would be considered a load and that would apply some weight so applying that weight would subtract the overall torque that you can very minimally but it will still subtract the torque and so now when you try to turn the servo into something else torque will be subtracted like you see right here so your overall torque won't be as much. What's the torque coming from the top? So this is from torque disturbances. So if you want to accommodate for disturbances like there always are in actual systems, you can accommodate for it right here. I mean, this is the point at which the torques come from. And so when you have torque disturbances, you can also consider that subtracting away the signal. And that's what it's doing here. You can see that there's a minus sign, and then there's some torque disturbance on the link end. but the link end is after the gearbox. You want to get it to where the actual motor is. That's why you step it through the gear transmission. You bring it to the motor end, and you can find out, and then you can subtract from this, because you're basically adding or subtracting like components. And right here, we're dealing with the torque closest to the motor, not after the gearbox. So that's why you have the kg here. And then everything else is the same. Does, does that make sense? Do you have any questions about that? It makes sense. Okay. So, remember how before I said that we can reduce the uh, blocks to make a lot simpler system? Well, we can reduce all of this 
into a simpler system. So if I go to the next page, you can see that's exactly what I did. So I did a couple things here. Um, all I did was, um, this is all in one line. So kg times this, and then kg times this. So kg squared times all of these, the polar moment of inertia and the viscous friction. And then we did uh, block diagram math algebra to be able to consolidate this into a single line. So when they're on a, when, when, when they're on the same line, it's very easy. It's just uh, multiplying. But when you have something like this, where it's sort of feedback and going into it, there's something special that you do uh, that I'll go over at a later time. I just want to get a high level of this, and then we can later go into the linear algebra of the block diagrams and how I got what I got. So J effective is what we named it. Um, the algebra turns out to be something like this, where you have JM plus the gear transmission squared times the polar moment of inertia at the end of the link axis. So yeah, polar moment of, the, of inertia of the motor plus kg squared times polar moment of inertia at the link axis. Because there's going to be a different pol uh, polar moment of inertia at the end of the gearbox than at the beginning of the gearbox. And you're just adding those together to get your total polar moment of inertia. Same with the viscous friction. And that's what this becomes. So now you have a block diagram that not only characterizes a motor, but is able to consider loads and torque disturbances into your system. So it's right there. And if you don't have a load, JL would just become zero, and, and BL would just become zero, just making this JM and BM, which was exactly what we had originally. So the next one is uh, transfer functions. The I, I've said this a little bit before, but when you get the main, um, w when you consolidate all of the blocks into one transfer function, and it, it's the main, um, kind of the, the main process of, of why you're making the, the control system. That's called the plant. So I can add a bunch of stuff to the control system. Being the controller, you um, you know what you can add what you want where you want. So the P's, the I's, the D's um, for the PID controllers to help um, kind of consolidate the signal to to make it a little bit nicer or do what you want it to do. Um, you you would be adding to the overall system, but the system itself, what you're trying to model is in this case a brushed DC motor. So your the plant would be the brush DC motor. That is your plant. And you'll hear that a lot in control systems, or whatever you're working with, that is the plant. And then a control engineer will add PID controllers to it, and maybe trajectory planning and generation to be able to, to make everything run a lot smoother. But the main plant is, in this case, the actuator, or the DC motor. And like I said before, the plants can be first, second, third order. The higher order they are, the more ability you have to, to analyze it a little bit further and do things with it. Not so much analyze it further because at first order, there's only so much that you can analyze about it. I would say maybe that there's more things that you can analyze about a second order because there's more things that are happening. So um, you can also increase the transfer function order make it from like a first to a second order transfer function by adding PID controllers. And that's the point. You add PID controllers so you can manipulate the values and essentially change, you're, you're changing the order when you add PID controllers. And when you change the order of it, you have more flexibility in what you can do. So if I started adding PID controllers to this system right here, this I can tell you just from experience right now is if I consolidate and you know all transfer function all blocks can be consolidated into one block I can make this all into one block and this actually turns out to be a single uh, order transfer function so this will have the same exact form as the K over TS plus one 
And then from there, you're able to find a time constant and a gain. But I want to be able to control this motor a little bit further. So you add PID controllers, and you can get up to second and maybe even, and actually you can get up to third order transfer functions. It, it becomes a little bit more advanced, but you can do more with it. And so this is, you know, we talked a little bit about the first order. And this is K over TS plus one. And something to note in transfer functions is it's the output over the input is the transfer function itself. So that's extremely important and will come in later use in uh, some of the other uh, mathematics that you do with the uh, working with control systems. But uh, you have your YS, uh, so your Y and then your S, and that will equal, or sorry, not the Y and the S, Y over X, your output over your input, and that will give you your transfer function. So mathematically, that's what it would be. And it, and it makes complete sense because um, it's your X multiplying by your transfer function that will give you Y. So if you take the X and you put it on the other side, you just get the transfer function. So for the second order, which is the limit and the highest order that we're going to go, is now this is the form of it. And exactly what you did with the other transfer functions, if you can get a transfer function to match this form, you're able to um, find out not only just the gain, but the undamped natural frequency. So the natural frequency of the system, have you ever, uh, a lot of the times I'm, I'm driving in my car and I go on the highway and I'm going a certain speed. At that speed, my car will start to shake because I'm meeting the frequency, the resonance, I'm meeting the resonance frequency of the car. And so it starts to vibrate a lot. It's generally very bad to meet this resonance frequency. So being able to control this frequency is a good thing. This is the undamped natural frequency. And you generally want it uh, twice as small as the resonance frequency so that there's no problems and whatever you're making doesn't shake apart. So it's the resonance frequency divided by two at the maximum that you want to get your frequency at. And then zeta right here is another variable that you can control. And that controls, um, that, that is called the uh, critical damping ratio. And you're able to change this accordingly to be able to, um, you're able to change this with PID controllers to get this to not oscillate so much, but will instead be a nice, even, um, nice smooth curve that will eventually just go straight to your gain. So you can see in a second order system, you have a lot of overshoot here. It's, it's a lot, and this is very bad. You don't want something like this. So by raising the critical damping ratio by over, something over one, you can get this to be a smoother curve. And again, we're gonna go a little bit more over this in the future, but this is essentially uh, what I wanted to talk to you about and we can go over quizzes uh, now. How do you go from the first order to the second order? So usually systems will turn itself out. Just the mathematics that you had to do will sometimes just become the second order. Or sometimes you add the PID controllers to make it a second order. Because when you have PID controllers and you make um, keep in mind the P. It, well, I, again, I, this is, I haven't gone into this yet, but the P is the proportional, the I is the integral, and the D is derivative. The I being the integral, you're going to have some component of S, because remember, one over S is the integral, and then just S is derivative, so you'll have components of S's, and the P doesn't have an S; it's just some proportion that you um, multiply by the system. But the I and the D have S's associated with it. 
And when you add S's to something like a first order, you get a second order by uh, multiplying the S's here. If you do it just by the D, multiplying the S, you'll get a second order. If you do it by the D and I, so you have I at least I and D, so P, I, D, you'll have a third order. And then from there, you're able to control even more things. So it's 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 a good thing to be um, having PID controllers in your system. And as an outcome, there'll be second to third order systems. For this second order system, I can control things like the race, the damping ratio and the, the frequency of the system. And by manipulating these values, being the uh, control engineer, you're able to get what you want out of your system. So essentially what you're doing is you're just, you're changing the inputs to the system accordingly by completely understanding your system as a whole. You can change the inputs accordingly with PID controllers so that the output will resemble what you want. So the damp is the damping ratio going to be the same as the So um, it's, uh, it's a little bit uh, too complicated to explain right now. Okay. We'll go over the transfer functions later on. In the quiz, in this quiz, quiz four and quiz five, I'm going to go over um, actually getting um, these type of values and seeing how PIDs, PID controllers, how they fit into all of this and, and why they, they what is, why are we talking about second order transfer functions and PID controllers? Why does this, why does this come together? And and once we do the quizzes each step at a time for each problem, I think uh, it'll start making sense. We have a lot more examples. Okay.